Thank you all for coming today and welcome. My name is Catherine Murray and I'm Associate Dean of Undergraduate Programs and Enrollment in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. When the opportunity for Canada 150 came up, it posed a real challenge to universities about how to commemorate such an event and how to engage students and faculty in different ways. What we decided was that we wanted to respond to uh, the calls for uh, uh, universities to demonstrate the value of an arts and social sciences degree. The value of such a degree not only in thinking about our past but also critiquing our present and visioning uh, alternatives for our future as well as concrete social actions to um, achieve those alternative futures. So an important time for a public university an important time for FAS and an important time for our faculty members. So this series rose out, arose out of nominations, um, not only for exceptional scholars, researchers, and teachers at the university, but those people who could show a kind of quirky interdisciplinarity uh, in a special way. And uh, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Henny. Young from Linguistics and Cognitive Science, who met that uh, task in spade. Very interesting proposal today to introduce us to multilingualism and uh, musicality. Part of the goal of events like this is to actually archive them for all time. We'll see if this digital form sustains another 50 years. But the challenge is not only to archive them on our website, but also repurpose them in a way that can assist us in reaching down to high schools and middle schools to tell them a little bit about what to expect when they come to university and choose to study a discipline in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. So we've got a wide array of scholars from different departments and disciplines. And today, you're going to be hearing about linguistics and cognitive science and how indeed it can contribute to our understanding of music and musicality, uh, which is fascinating to me. So I also am very happy to uh, welcome students, and we had no trouble getting great students to step forward to participate in the proceedings. The first half, up to about 25 minutes, is over to Dr. De Jong, who will be, in fact, um, providing with providing us with both its research and review of some of the uh, literature. And then our students, um, Kim Mann, and just raise your hand for a moment, and uh, Yuki Kaneki uh, will be leading the discussion and then involving you in it as well. Don't forget this is our opportunity on a Wednesday to also have luncheon and civilized discourse and perhaps even some music, and I'm gobsmacked to say we plan for everything except the music component in terms of the playlist for our pizza and polemic. So, uh, Henny will forgive us, I hope. Uh, why, uh, Henny? Um, I think the question about whether learning a new language can make us better musicians is something that we should all consider for the next 50 years. I think that the background he has in disciplinary uh, training is really intriguing. Bachelor of Science in Neurolinguistics from Duke. MA and PhD in developmental psychology, but he's not in the psych department. He's in Cox Sci. He was a CNRS researcher at the Laboratoire Psychologie de Perception and at the University of Paris de uh, Descartes, sorry for mangling that, and is now a faculty member, as you know, in both disciplines, linguistics and cognitive science. I think um, his uh, importance is that he directs the language learning and development lab here, which you may not even have heard of. I hadn't known about uh, when I uh, re-arrived in FAS for about a year. At that lab, he, together with his research team, asks how language learning affects sensory perception, articulatory motor abilities, articulatory, I like that, and human cognition, both in infants and young children acquiring their native languages, as well as adults learning a new language. Join me in welcoming Dr. Young.
Uh, I want to take this moment to thank Catherine Murray and also Joanna, Joanna Robinson at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences for the invitation to give you a short talk on uh, mu multilingualism and musicality in Canada on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of Confederation. So let's take a moment to think about what Canada sounds like. This is actually a project that CBC has a website for and a anybody can submit a sound uh, recording to the website and it will be archived by the Department of Canadian Heritage on, uh, as a celebration of Canada 150. If you go to this website, you'll see things like uh, the sound of milk coming out of a bag or <laughs> um, the display at the Montreal airport or the sound of a marmot or somebody putting on hockey gear. Or a sandbone. <laughs> exactly. Um, but as a linguist, I think for me, one of the most important sounds of Canada are the languages that we speak here, right? So Canada has two official languages, French and English, and as you can see here, around 80% of the population of this country has one of these languages as their mother tongue. It's the language that they learned when they were little. Uh, around 18% of these people speak uh, French and English. They're bilingual. And what's interesting is that around 20% of the Canadian population speaks a non-official language as a mother tongue. This is almost as large as the Francophone population in Canada. So one of the things that you might ask yourself is, what are the languages that are non-official? Uh, this is also from the same census data from 2011. And this is the top 22 most spoken non-official language, uh, languages in Canada. And there's a couple of things to notice about this list. So as you sort of scan through the list of languages here. The first is that Aboriginal languages do not appear on this list. And that is because less than 0.01% of the Canadian population uses an Aboriginal language on a regular basis or has it as a mother tongue. This means that an important part of our heritage is highly endangered. The second thing to note about this list of languages is that people come to Canada from all over, which means that the languages that we speak here come from many different parts of the world. So we have languages from Asia, and we have languages from East and South Asia, um, languages from other continents, uh, from the immigrants that come to this country. When immigrants come to Canada, they come to all many different parts, but they especially come to the largest cities of Canada. So I'm going to show you some data about this from Toronto and from Vancouver. This is again a census map. And what you can see here are a lot of dark green little areas here. And what that represents are census districts where over half of the inhabitants there speak a non-official language as a mother tongue. What you can see is that Toronto is highly linguistically diverse. In fact, around 40% of Torontonians speak a non-official language as a mother tongue. It should be unsurprising to us in this room that Vancouver is somewhat of a similar situation. This is the data for Vancouver. You can see that areas of south, the city of south, uh, the city of Vancouver, sorry, area, the southern areas of the city of Vancouver, as well as the eastern areas, Richmond, southern Burnaby, northern Coquitlam, parts of Surrey, uh, they also have areas where more than half of the people living there speak one of these non-official languages as a mother tongue. And like Toronto, around 40% of inhabitants of Vancouverites speak one of these languages as a mother tongue. So when we think about multilingualism in Canada, just to recap, we have a couple of main ideas. One is that many people speak English and French, almost everybody in Canada, one of those languages. Around one-fifth of them are bilingual. A very, very small percent, less than one-tenth of one percent of people speak an Aboriginal language. And 20% of people uh, speak or regularly use one of these immigrant languages. Okay. So when we think about Canadian sounds, we have a better grasp of what languages we hear in Canada and what we speak. <coughs> but another part of the Canadian soundscape is, of course, music, right? And when we think of what Canadian music involves, we can think of some iconic bands. So people, especially from my generation, might think immediately of the tragically hip. But that's not the only kind of Canadian music we have. We can think of 
Aboriginal music. And then we can think of newer incarnations of Aboriginal music, like A Tribe Called Red or Tanya Tagak. We can also think of sort of the global best-selling artists. So we'll talk about people like Drake and Justin Bieber and uh, The Weeknd. We can also think about uh, crooners and singers, so uh, Celine Dion and Sarah McLachlan and Burnaby's own Michael Bublé. We can think about singer-songwriters, Leonard Cohen, Neil Young, Joni Mitchell. We can think about country music from Atlantic Canada. We can think about jazz from Montreal. We can think about Canadian indie artists like Lisa Feist or Arcade Fire. Right? So these are a couple of things that I thought of, at least, when I was thinking about what Canadian music might entail. Canadians, as statistics show, love to listen to music. So one of the things I'm showing here is the ranking of GDP, which is a measure of economic output for different countries. Canada, Canada ranks 10th in the world, but in terms of music industry revenue, that is how much people spend on streaming, downloading, buying CDs, going to concerts, Canada ranks 5th. Canadians love to listen to music much more than other countries as a function of GDP. We can also think about the kinds of artists that Canadians, uh, music, musicians that, Can that Canada produces. So I showed you a list before. And this is a ranking of the top 10 global recording artists. So in terms of how much music artists are able to sell, this is the top 10 from 2016. And if you look at this list, three of them are Canadian. So these are the people that we saw earlier. We saw Drake, we saw Justin Bieber, and we saw The Weeknd, right? So, in terms of musicality in Canada, we can again think of a couple of things. So one of them is that Canadian music spans a number of different genres, from Aboriginal traditional music, newer incarnations of that, pop, rock, country, jazz. We can think that, we, 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 can, we saw that Canadians spend more than their fair share in terms of music, so they spend a lot relative to GDP. And in addition, we saw that among top recording artists, Canada is well represented. So languages, music in Canada, we have a lot of both of these, of these things. And now we're going to ask, what is the link between these two kinds of things? And I think one of the key ideas here is the major elements of music. So when we think about rhythm and when we think about uh, melody, these concepts also exist in speech and language. Right? So when we talk about speech and language, we can also talk about the rhythm of language and the melody of speech. Uh, another way of talking about this is uh, I'm going to give to Drake, who, as we remember, is our <laughs> top global recording artist of 2016, who also happens to be Canadian. Uh, and I think one thing to know about Drake is that Drake is a rapper. So Drake knows his way about around the rhythm of words and sentences and phrases and so on. Right? But what, is, what makes Drake special uh, is that he's also known as a singer. And so I think here in this clip from The National, a show on CBC from 2013, Drake is talking about how in this, uh, in his latest album in the video, he was really incorporating elements of both rap and singing. What I tried to do with this album was blur the lines so that even when I am singing, it just doesn't feel like singing. And even when I'm rapping, the cadences are almost melodic to the point that they stick in your head. So I think one of the key things that, uh, the key insights that Drake is making as a rapper is that language has its rhythm and its melody. And Drake is taking full advantage of this when he writes the lyrics in the way that he does, when he's rapping, but rapping in a melodic way. Right? So he's talking about cadences and melody and how he's interweaving all of these elements to create a successful album. So when we talk about Canadian music and Canadian languages, we can think about what are the rhythm and melody of these languages, uh, how do they differ? And for a moment, I'm going to talk about French and English, Canada's two official languages. And we're going to talk about the rhythm of French versus English. So imagine for a moment that we're in a car dealership and we're buying a car. Okay? 
Now, if we speak in French, then we are going to buy a Toyota. And what I'm showing here is the syllables of uh, the sentence in French. So if I say something like, on achète le Toyota, what I'm doing when I speak French is I'm giving roughly equal time to each of the syllables, which is represented here by the black dots. So in this particular sentence, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven syllables, okay? In French, if I say another sentence that has the same number of syllables, on fait l'achat de Honda, or de l'onda, then it has uh, also seven syllables, and you can see that it takes roughly the same amount of time, because in French, there's a specific kind of rhythm that we donate roughly equal time to each syllable. For those of you who have learned English, uh, this doesn't come easily to native speakers of English, but those of you who have, who have had to learn English as a second language, one of the things you realize is that this is not how English rhythm works. If we buy the same car in an English car dealership and we say something like, we purchase the Toyota, you can hear that there's this kind of stress that's assigned. And when we have the same number of syllables, we emphasize certain syllables, which are indicated here by the large circles. So again, when we say something like, we purchase the Toyota, and we say something like, we buy the Honda, both of these sentences take roughly the same amount of time to say, even though the bottom sentence here has fewer numbers of syllables. And the reason for this is because when we speak in English, we tend to adjust our timing to these stress units. In both of these sentences, there's these two kind of stress units. So this is interesting because now we have a situation where the rhythm of language is different between English which we would call stress-timed, and French, which we would call syllable-timed, right? So one of the first questions we can ask is whether or not having a language that uses this kind of rhythm affects the way that we might write some music. And a number of researchers have studied this question. So one of the things that you can do is you can look at folk songs that come from countries that speak either English or French. So I'll play for you in a moment uh, a folk song from England, English Country Garden, okay? So you can see right away that there's this kind of rhythmic pulse to these folk tunes. Now think of a French folk tune, right? So what's a French folk tune that comes to mind? You might think of Frère Jacques. So I guess it's probably not a coincidence that I chose these folk tunes, and you might be skeptical and say, okay, <laughs> um, yeah, that's nice, but then you just happen to choose two folk tunes that match to your hypothesis about this language rhythm. Um, well, of course, these, are re these set of researchers were more savvy about that, so they analyzed uh, thousands of classical music themes written by composers around the turn of the 20th century. And I'm gonna give you two examples here. Uh, so the first is an English composer, uh, Elgar. This is from the Enigma Variations. So I hope that this sounds very English to you, right? <laughs> and so now I'll, I'll present you a French composer. So this is Poulon. So I hope that you can hear some of these very subtle differences. And the next time you're listening to classical music on the radio, you can try to make some guesses about the nationality of the composer based on this kind of rhythm. So I run the Language Learning and Development Lab at SFU. And of course, I'm interested in how people learn languages. And this is relevant for that as well. So in a study that we did, we took, uh, we, we examined a sample of native French speakers and we were interested in what happened when they learned English, right? So if your native language has a certain kind of rhythm and then you're learning a second language that has another kind of this variable rhythm, the question was, will you get better at perceiving musical rhythms? 
So what we did is we sampled a large group of them. So we took around 150 native speakers of French and we asked them how long they had studied English. And then we gave them a kind of test. And I'm going to simulate that for you. So what you're going to hear are two short musical phrases. They're just rhythmic phrases. There's no melody here. And you just have to guess whether they're the same or different. So I'll give you one right now. Un, deux, trois, quatre. All right, so how many of you, raise your hand if you think those are the same. Those are actually different. So here's another sample. So raise your hand if this was different. Yes, this was different. But this is easy for you because I'm giving this talk in English. So you've learned English or speak it, right? <laughs> Um, so what we found is that the longer that these native French speakers had studied English, the better they were at this kind of task. They were not good at a melody kind of task. Okay? So uh, this is something about language rhythm. We can talk a little bit more about language melodies as well. And so one of the most obvious ways that we use melody in language is intonation. So in English, if I say these kinds of sentences, I never said he made that, or I, I never said he made that, I never said he made that, or I never said he made that. In all of these situations, I'm saying the same thing, but there's a kind of connotation or sort of hidden meaning that is different when I use intonation differently across these English sentences. Right? So we're using melody all the time when we speak. If we look at the kinds of languages that are spoken in a non-official capacity in Canada, we can think about the ways that these languages use melody. And a subset of these languages use melody in a very, very sophisticated way. Languages like Vietnamese, or Chinese languages, or even Punjabi, these are what we call tonal languages. In other words, the melody of these languages can change the meaning of different words. So for example, in Cantonese, as you'll see, there's a number of words that uh, differ in the melody, and the way that you pronounce the words, the pitch that you assign when you say the words can change the meaning of them. C, 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 C. So you can see that in Cantonese, it's pretty hard to say things correctly <laughs> if you're not paying attention to melody, right? Uh, a more well-known example, but a simpler one, is from Mandarin. Ma, ma. Ma, ma. And a slightly less, less well-known example is from Punjabi. So many people don't know that Punjabi is an Indo-European language, which means that it's related uh, historically to a lot of the languages spoken uh, historically in Europe. But it also has this property. Curry, curry, curry. Okay. So uh, this is another sophisticated way that languages use melody. Now, one of the questions you might ask is whether or not uh, speaking one of these languages as a native language similarly affects the way that you perceive music. And this is research that was conducted at the Language and Brain Laboratory in the Department of Linguistics at SFU, who's headed by my colleague, uh, Dr. Yue Wang. Uh, and so what you can do is you can take groups of people who have different native languages, some people who have a native language like Chinese, and some people who have a native language that is not tonal, like English or French or Spanish. And you can ask them whether they can hear melodies less or uh, better or, or, or not as well. And so I'll give you a sample of uh, a kind of music test. This is not the one that, they, that we use at, that, that Dr. Wong uses at SFU, but it's something similar. Um, it's going to be two musical phrases. Again, you say whether they're the same or different. So are, are these different? Raise your hand. Yeah, they are different. Are, are these different? Right, these are the same. Right, so, so you are also very good because you're hearing lots of Chinese. Um, so uh, 
the actual data are a little bit more complicated. So whether or not you are better at listening to music depends a lot on the specific kind of task that you're doing and the specific type of language that you know. But broadly, uh, it does appear that tone language speakers, so speakers of uh, Vietnamese, Chinese, Punjabi maybe, um, there is some uh, advantage to hearing pitch even in these kind of non-linguistic domains like music. So uh, multilingualism and musicality, I think what we're seeing here is a lot of parallels in the way, the way, in the way that our brain treats music and language. Right? So there's a lot of similarities in terms of rhythm and melody and how we hear music on the one hand and language on the other. Uh, when we think about what this has to do with Canada, I want you to reflect on a couple of things. So the first thing that you might think about uh, is when we look at this map of Toronto that we've seen already and these dark squares representing areas of, of many people speaking these non-official languages, we can think about Drake, right? So Drake grew up in this neighborhood. And I'm not trying to say that Drake is successful only because he grew up in Toronto, otherwise we'd have uh, 10 million successful musicians from Canada. <laughs> um, so Drake obviously has a lot of innate talent. His father was a musician, so uh, is a musician, sorry. So uh, Drake heard a lot of music when he was growing up. Drake was in an arts program in high school. Drake is also doing a kind of music that is very popular uh, in this moment in history, right? But I think one thing that we can sort of think about is that Drake's innate or sensibilities about the way that uh, language has a rhythm and the way that language has a melody, maybe part of that comes from the fact that Drake heard a lot of languages when he was growing up. When we think about our little uh, slide of these well-known Canadian musicians, we can see that a lot of them, uh, this is true for a lot of them. So everybody who's growing up in Canada has some exposure to French and English, of course, uh, but people like Justin Bieber went to French immersion, for example, and The Weeknd, uh, his grandmother spoke Amharic and raised the weekend right, in Toronto. We can also think about Leonard Cohen who grew up in Montreal and heard French and English and also Yiddish in his family. Uh, and we can think about Michael Buble who probably heard some Chinese, right? So uh, this is um, what I want us to reflect upon is how part of being Canadian is having some knowledge about English and French and being exposed to these uh, to this variety of languages, and how maybe that influences our sensibility and appreciation for music. Okay, thank you. Who knew? Uh, really interesting. Um, I'd like to invite up our two students right at the moment. Um, first of all, uh, Kim, come on up, and uh, Yuki. And I'll ask, um, this is a wonderful opportunity for them, actually. Um, so please join uh, Andy up here. And uh, we'll begin with Yuki's question, and then move on. OK, so that related to the, uh, the Henny's presentation. Um, there's a few, I plan the language action program. And um, a lot of Cantonese, Mandarin, uh, Punjabi speakers, Vietnamese speakers uh, sign up for program, but uh, we have a difficult time to match up students. But as Henny said, those languages are uh, um, sophisticated musicality. So I, I question is more like um, uh, helping this community. So how do we, how do we like promote those languages um, on SFU campus? So we have a lot of international students and those languages are sophisticated uh, music, uh, musicality, but a lot of students uh, don't know about it. A lot of students go to the, um, the languages are very strong, like a French, English, German, Spanish, Japanese, mm -hmm. the popular languages. Mm -hmm. So how, um, the, how do we kind of promote those um, kind of un, um, popular languages on campus? But I have a kind of like a, Think that this musicality thing help SFU community to realize we should um, kind of appreciate that, that we are living in this diverse community. So, is there anyone have some idea? Um, I was saying promoting languages on campus. 
Excellent question. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> right, so I mean, this is, this is a question that, that's not just for me, it's, it's for every, every member of the SFU community. But I can say a little bit about language learning um, very broadly, which is that when we learn language, what predicts success or what predicts whether somebody will learn a language is, is highly complicated. There's a lot of things that go into it. Mm -hmm. But I think your intuition is exactly right in the sense that one of the important factors that predicts whether we'll become a fluent speaker of the language that we learn is how motivated we are mm -hmm. and uh, the kinds of, of reasons we have for learning that language in the first place. So if you're just learning a language in school and you have to learn French because you're going to a Canadian school, uh, then it's not surprising that, that the outcomes for learning French don't turn out very well, especially in provinces like British Columbia, which are very far from the Francophone centers of Canada. And so I think uh, to help people, to motivate people to learn language, you really need to think about um, what are the reasons that they want to study those languages. And uh, so when we think now about things like K-pop, the popularity of music coming out of Korea, uh, I'm sure that in terms of enrollments in Korean classes, you find definitely an increase. Uh, in terms of the number of restaurants that in Richmond that are opening uh, with Korean-themed food, uh, that's, that's definitely, uh, we saw that um, after you know, a Korean television show came on. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to uh, look at that, you need to think about what are the kinds of cultural exports from countries uh, that, that speak these languages? Mm -hmm. um, are people gonna find them interesting? Um, and I think that's going to be an important part of, of getting people interested. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Excellent start of the discussion. We'll return to it. Okay. So my question is, um, music is something that children love. And so can we use this music to help children learning English in classrooms in elementary school to learn in a more fun way or a way that would be more successful, especially for international students? Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, so you're absolutely right. I, th I think uh, kids love music, and it's something that's universal to uh, every human culture is that, that there is some kind of form of music or um, uh, music, yeah, there's some kind of cultural form that, that uses music. Uh, children are certainly no exception. And I will say that there's a lot of research uh, looking at this question very seriously. So using musical interventions to help kids who are having trouble with uh, speech so uh, one of the questions that's been tackled recently by a number of researchers is whether uh, taking advantage of kids' appreciation for music can help them in cases where kids have certain types of speech pathologies. Uh, so that's work that's still very active, um, but it's, it's definitely something that's, that's going on. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We have an opportunity now for questions from the uh, audience. What? Yeah, I was just, uh, I grew up in Africa with more than one language, but also more than one music, because my parents came from India, so there was Indian music, and then there was the African music, and then there was the American music, or Caribbean music. So I was wondering in terms of uh, speaking languages and learning, because a lot of this music was with English lyrics. So my question is, can you have ethnic music, but English lyrics, and what impact does it have? Because I, I see a lot of grandparents, for example, they, they speak many language, but then they pick up and dance on different uh, music. Uh, so I, can you kind of connect the language speaking with different music and the impact of English lyrics? Because even First Nation songs like OCM, we are one family, it's a beautiful song by Susan Alcock, but there's a mixture of uh, nation language and English. Yeah, so when, I mean, when we think uh, about the way that music is composed, uh, you know, we saw that there's, there's maybe some linguistic influence in the way that you write music. But there are certainly cases, for example, the Canadian National Anthem was first written in French and then later uh, somebody created English lyrics for that, for that same tune, right? Uh, and so I think, uh, there's a couple of questions that, that I think you're asking. So, so one of them is um, what happens when you take a, a music that's written in one language and then later on you transpose English lyrics to that? Um, so yeah, so certainly that, that's something that people do all the time. Um, and when we look at the music industry, 
uh, it's certainly the case that, that recording artists will first record a song in their native language, and then um, as they become more popular, they'll re-record that song with different lyrics. It also works with the Beatles. The Beatles recorded songs in German and uh, in French as well um, after they became hits. So that, that's the kind of process that happens you know, all the time. But I think your other question is something about the relation between music and language. And so um, we can think about you know, uh, music and language go together quite often. Um, and so at least in, in terms of the research that I presented, uh, definitely there, there is some, we have to be very careful that the effects that we look at between groups, so between, let's say, Chinese groups versus English groups, that they listen to different music as well, or they heard different music when they were little, and so it's important to separate those, those factors. And that, that's something that, that we definitely try to do um, in some of our studies. Um, but yeah, I, I hope I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering 100% no, no, your question, but. My experience, uh, for example, I have studied French stuff. I can memorize any anthem in French, and I've tried many times in English, I can't. I don't know why. <laughs> so maybe the songs that are written in one language and then have you know, English lyrics, they become. Boring. Yeah, they become boring <laughs> because they, <laughs> they don't match. And that, that maybe, you may be onto something. So, so maybe it's, it's because the original rhythm doesn't match any, the, the lyrics anymore. It's something about changing the language when you sing, um, it takes something from it. That's definitely true, yeah. Anyone else? Just a little question. I think you mentioned Amharic. Mm -hmm. What is that? Uh, Amharic is a language that's spoken uh, in the Horn of Africa. Um, so it's uh, in Ethiopia, essentially. So it's one of the main languages there. Yeah. I have a few questions. Is that fair? Um, could you go back to uh, the slide where you are showing statistics Canada data on Vancouver? Sure. Uh, Can you see that? I found it really interesting. Um, we still disproportionately draw, although this university is internationalizing very, very quickly, we still disproportionately draw from domestic students, kindergarten to grade 12 throughout the lower mainland area. And our biggest area is areas of intake, if you'll notice, uh, Coquitlam, Burnaby, um, Increasingly Surrey, given our Surrey campus, probably all these areas here, this direction, are not the areas with the greatest linguistic diversity in the K-12 area. We increasingly know that we have permanent residents and, and uh, 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 students coming new to Canada as a part of that K-12 intake. But that's a very interesting finding. So what do we do with that information? Uh, how do we position SFU as a gateway to new language and intercultural understanding? Yeah, well, uh, that's, a, that's a question for your office, not mine. But <laughs> 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 yeah, all of us. My yeah. university in the next 50 years is going to uh, really not have these distinctions between administration and. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That was, that was, that was, a, that was a, a, a cheap joke. Um, <laughs> um, so so I, th I think you're right. And I think that SFU is certainly making strides in this direction. So we have uh, Fraser International College, for example, yes. that is working very heavily in groups um, of, of speakers who are uh, not native English speakers, um, but want to go to a, an English university. Yes. Um, and so th I think that's, those kinds of programs are definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, in terms of the students who come to Fraser International College, I don't know how many of them come from the Lower Mainland area, yeah. um, but that seems to me a matter of, of you know, letting people know in these communities that that's an option. Um, I would say that, that you know, in these areas, there's many cases of people um, who, are, who have a certain mother tongue, but then their kids will use that language and English. Right? So those, those kids will not be going to Fraser International College, per se. Uh, what is the incentive for those who speak English first to acquire additional languages, plural? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a good question. I think it's similar to the one that, that uh, Yuki has. So I think one of the first answers is that you have to have a cultural interest in cultural products that are produced in that language. So when we think K-pop is a great example, because we see how many native English-speaking uh, students 
adore K-pop, right? And so I think there's a, there's a big incentive to learn things like um, Korean that, th that didn't exist maybe 10, 15 years ago. Uh, same thing with Japanese manga. So uh, when that was popular, you saw a big uh, ups uptick in the interest in learning Japanese. Languages kind of lurk at SFU, and they lurk within the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences as a general requirement for education. Now, I'm going to propose a question, and I would be very interested in hearing the response from this audience. What if we actually embedded a requirement for more than one language as a part of your degree? So we could, in fact, argue that some linguistic competence and awareness of the different musicalities and cultural contributions of different language groups was a part of everyday undergraduate education for everybody. What if over the next 50 years? So I think certainly the data that I'm presenting is showing that, that linguistic diversity is a part of uh, Canadian society. So 20% of, uh, of our country uh, speaks a non-official language, right? And I think that there's a lot of ways to uh, explore that. And one problem is that it's very diverse. So there's lots and lots of different um, languages. So it's a lot of resources to teach every single of these 22 languages that's, that's on the list. But certainly, there are things that are very unique to Canada. So in terms of um, large groups of immigrants coming from Asia, or in terms of the aboriginal languages that um, only exist in this part of the world. Uh, that's something that I think is really important and that the university should um, play a role in promoting. How many people here would like to see the university promote more languages? And then I'll turn to the questions. Raise your hands. More with respect to language training? More required with respect to language training? Mandatory language training is what Okay. All right. I just wanted to check. Question up here and then I have a question back there. Yes, I would have a question of whether you have looked into the relationship between learning languages, musicality, and then the impact on the accents that these people may have. So meaning that if you speak several languages, if you perhaps even play a musical instrument, does this have an impact on the way you are able to pronounce language, to imitate other accents, to accept, let's say, more English or more French or whatever melodic that this language has? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so we haven't looked at specifically this question in particular, but I uh, will say something about um, sort of accents and, and language. In our department, uh, we really emphasize intelligibility over accent. Mm -hmm. So there are certainly uh, people who worry a lot about what their accent sounds like, but um, what people in our department, uh, Murray Monroe specifically in SFU Linguistics, really encourages people to worry more about intelligi intelligibility. Yeah, to make sure that people understand them, whether, even though you have an accent. Uh, for many people, it's extremely difficult to get rid of um, an accent. And a lot of people who offer accent reduction um, kind of training, it's not really, uh, there's not a lot of good evidence that actually helps. Um, and so uh, I should emphasize that, that one of the things we try to do is we emphasize intelligibility, intelligibility over accent reduction. And um, the other part of that is uh, how you can produce sounds or how flexible you are in producing sounds. And that is something that, that we have um, active research projects on. Uh, and yes, uh, some of the music intervention studies that I was mentioning earlier, so using music training to encourage um, better uh, speech production and speech uh, perception. Those are things that are actively um, going on right now in large scales involving you know, thousands of, of, of people. Um, yeah, so th these things are happening now. I have a question. Okay. No, was it going behind me? Okay. Okay. Um, I actually have a question around, uh, you know, the idea of linguistic or even a cultural influence on developing music. So what's coming to my mind right now is uh, looking at, for example, I work with the Punjabi community quite a bit. Is that we uh, a team had produced uh, an art exhibit in the Museum of Vancouver on Bhangra, for example, and saying that there's a very unique Vancouver brand of Bhangra on the global market. And so my question is almost the reverse of what you're speaking about is. How did this then, can you, is there a way to measure or to look at in some capacity the influence that the context of how that music is produced, either linguistic or cultural influence, ends up creating this new sort of genre or form of music within, and within that community? That's yeah. kind of, it's, it's documented as being, you know, on the map of producing a unique type similar to the UK or similar to the Japanese itself or other areas. So I was just wondering if you had any insights on that. Yeah, that's a great 
point. So this idea that something unique emerges from the fact that you have contact between different forms of dance or different forms of art, that happens in food, right? So um, Chinese food in Vancouver has its own brand because of you know, this West Coast influence. Um, it also happens in language. So uh, one of the unique parts about Canadian French is that it actually is sounds quite different in terms of rhythm from European French. The study that I showed you with this even keeled rhythm, that was actually done in uh, France, not in Canada. And one of the reasons for that is Canadian French has more of this kind of stress timing yes. than European yes. French does. Uh, and so definitely that does happen in terms of uh, language. So when we look at the influence of English contact with Canadian French, um, that has definitely uh, sort of, it, you, we, we can hear it when we listen to a Canadian French show, for example. Um, in Vancouver specifically, I mean Vancouver is such a young place and these patterns of immigration are in the history of the country relatively recent. So um, yeah, I, I, it's, I'm interested, yeah, but I don't have any Great Thank examples. Yeah. Another question over here. Yeah, my question is actually very similar to what you were just talking about because I was going to ask about what types of regional differences you noticed. For example, like you said, are you from France, are you from Quebec, are uh -huh. you from Belgium, for example, and also in terms of like English, what kinds of differences have you noticed from different speakers from around the world? Uh, speakers? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's many, many differences, especially for English, which is um, you know widely spoken across the world and is a language that has the most number of second language speakers, right? Uh, so there's definitely people in the Department of Linguistics uh, who study uh, world Englishes, so Suzanne Hilgendorf, for example. Um, so she would be much better qualified to answer this kind of question, but do you have any specific um, ideas or, or questions about particular regions or ways in which? Uh, yeah, for example, you're talking about like, how English is better in this a stress time. Uh, okay, um, yeah. And so yeah, I've always, well actually that's not for me, for example, I used to live in Quebec, and I found that like Quebecois people spoke really, really quickly, and uh -huh. it was always much easier to understand like French people in France. Uh -huh. And so I don't know if there's anything similar like that in English. Like, do you think that North Americans speak faster than, say, something from Britain? Yeah, speech rate is definitely something that varies by region. It varies highly inter-individually. So some people just speak a lot faster than other people. Uh, in terms of speech rhythm, yes, there are. Uh, kinds of English that sort of, because of contact with other languages, have a particular rhythm. So one of the things, examples that comes to mind is Singlish, or the English that's spoken in Singapore. So uh, Singlish is uh, a language that when you hear it, it sounds um, actually quite rhythmic. And that's because uh, the, con the languages that it has contact with, uh, Chinese, uh, Malay, these are languages that have more of this kind of syllable timing. Uh, and so yes, this de definitely happens uh, in, in any cases where you have contact between different groups of speakers. Um, maybe that'll happen one day in Vancouver, uh, we'll see, but you know, currently we don't think of Vancouver English as being very, very different than Alberta English. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to turn to Yuki and Kim for one last question. Water grows? Um, can I pass? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Um, going back to learning English as a second language, maybe it could also follow adults who want to learn English and, and just learning different types of melody. Like English, as you were saying, when we change our prosody, it can change the whole meaning of the sentence. So instead, usually for a second language adult learner, they'll just be memorizing. They won't have a lot of immersion, but is there? We can always use music to help them too, especially when they're trying to form questions versus declarative forms of sentences. Yeah, no, this is this is a good point. So, uh, I think your question is getting at this intuition that we all have when we take French as a second language or uh, English as a second language that when you take a language in a classroom then what you're usually told to focus on are things like the consonants and the vowels and the meanings of words and how to structure a sentence and you're not often given a lot of explicit instruction about how your melody should be right so how you pronounce the pitch and the rhythm of, of something but that is an important part not only for meaning but for um, sounding intelligible right uh, and so that's something that yeah I think that uh, when we learn language we can definitely incorporate more of these kinds of uh, musical cues in teaching. That's definitely a, a good point. Um. Yeah. I wanted to conclude with a question and uh, 
uh, uh, one is uh, strategic for this institution again, and the other is personal. Um, strategic for this institution, uh, I think SFU has a great opportunity in its move towards internationalization, which is actually more intense than many other post-secondary institutions in British Columbia, um, to explore this notion of inter intelligibility and intercultural language training um, and become a, a world leader. What is it that you would like to see for us if you could do that? How, how can we become well-known uh, as a leader in Canada in this field? Notwithstanding linguistics, is, reputation is rising like a star. We know that. But aside from that, what would you like to say? <laughs> aside from giving our department more funds now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so start there. No. Um, uh, no, in all, in all seriousness, uh, I think that you're right, is, is that when we look at the future of higher education and we look at sort of the demographics of, you know, so Canada as a country uh, lets lots of immigrants in because we know that our country, uh, you know, we're, on average, we're, we're, well, all of us are getting older, I suppose, but um, Canadians especially. And so, and so like other industrialized countries like Germany, for example, um, we need immigrants to sort of um, keep uh, Canadian society vital. And I think that that's, that's also true in a maybe slightly different way for higher education in Canada. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things that will continue to be true in the future is an English education being uh, very important for entering a lot of markets around the world. And um, I think given SFU's location and its uh, sort of current efforts to integrate international students in, in our um, degree, we can certainly make that part of our brand um, in terms and how do we do that that's sort of the critical part programming. yeah I mean programming so thinking about so as you said drawing attention to um, the need for linguistic diversity drawing attention to um, our strength in um, making people come to the to this university and then leaving being able to perform work in English and doing it well um, that's something that, that that we can work on wonderful Last question is really intended for uh, potentially our high school audiences. And um, if you were asked a question about how to prepare for studying linguistics, what would you respond? How so, did you end up coming to linguistics and what did you do to prepare yeah. in high school? Um, <laughs> So d to be perfectly honest, uh, my high school didn't have any linguistics program, so I didn't do anything to prepare for linguistics <laughs> when I was in high school. But um, when I arrived at university, I was very curious about different languages. So I took two foreign languages uh, my first year of university, and that continued for basically three or four of my years. And I think at some point somebody said, uh, you're taking all these language courses, why don't you take a linguistics course? And um, I did, and here I am now. Um, but I think it is important to think, to, you know, so when you learn language in high school, it may not be the same as when you learn in a university. So the kinds of techniques that people use or the kinds of things and terminology that people talk about when you learn language, that's helpful for linguistics. So learning the difference between um, nominative and accusative case, that's not just for your English grammar class, but that's also something that's, that's relevant to all uh, languages. So that's something that, that you know, if you liked learning a uh, foreign language in high school, um, you're definitely going to like linguistics. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful, wonderful introduction. Thanks. Thank you.